Look at that. <laughs> the magic touch. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I just figured out a new uh, a new solution to how, you know, sometimes right after the intro, it There's shows us. Yeah, yeah, that little blip. I think I just figured that out. I'll have to share that with Gregarious. Uh, our, our producer, our wonderful producer and longtime uh, BFF who's not with us today, uh, maybe stopping by for a surprise appearance. But John, hello. Reunion. Here we are again. Reunion. Here we yeah. are again. Excellent. And we missed you last week. What a what an incredible uh, virtual reality experience that I'm sure we'll, uh, as we're talking about, explore in uh, in in the near future again. I uh, uh, was disappointed to uh, not be there, but uh, I look forward to getting the uh, the remedial course. Oh man, it's so it's just the kind of stuff that you geek out on. But with that said, we get to geek out on all kinds of new stuff today. Uh, welcome, welcome everyone to Intersections. Uh, please let us know where you are tuning in from. We will feature uh, your questions, your comments, your thoughts, uh, your input on stage. We'll also make sure that we get uh, we get to your questions in real time as best we can. Uh, with that said, I'm just going to dive right in and introduce us. Welcome to Intersections, a <laughs> weekly conversational jam session that dives deep into the intersections among technology, innovation, culture, and ideas. Uh, every week, every Thursday at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, we bring diverse personalities and worldviews together in the service of greater understanding and unlearning. I am super proud to introduce my co-founder and co-host, John Keo, whom the economist has called Mr. Creativity and a serial innovator, and that he is a tireless, a tireless uh, innovator and leader uh, all around the world, sharing his vision for the future and helping businesses, organizations, governments, you name it, uh, compete for the future <laughs> right now. Uh, he also chairs the Institute for Large Scale Innovation, uh, amongst other things. He's also a Tony nominated producer of Film and Stage, and he wrote the best selling jamming, The Art and Discipline of Business Creativity. John, welcome to Intersections. Hey, Brian, great to be here. Great to be with my partner, Brian Solis, who I have now have the pleasure of introducing. Uh, I'm gonna volley across the net since we're uh, you know just past Wimbledon here and uh, point out that Brian <laughs> is a polymath communicator and domain expert who really was immersed in matters digital before digital was a thing and who has pioneered uh, the application of digital to social media, to marketing, uh, to innovation, to organizational transformation, and other related topics. Uh, he's a keynote speaker. He's a best-selling author. He's a prolific um, presence on the internet. And with all that, he also has a day job, which is Global Evangelist for Innovation at Salesforce. So this is my missing um, innovation twin here. And together we make, uh, we make uh, a whole brain, a whole innovation brain. <laughs> Definitely working on it. I've been in awe of the things that you've accomplished and continue to do. Uh, and it's an absolute pleasure to be part of the show with you. Uh, with that said, everyone, please let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, as we, we have some actually two amazing guests today. Well, I say that every week, but it's true. It is true. Uh, and so we want to feature your thoughts, comments, uh, and questions uh, with them. So with that, I'm going to bring up our first guest, uh, who's actually a longtime friend as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, just the brain on this guy, as you'll find, is going to be uh, wonderfully inspiring and, and hopefully contagious because I could use a little bit of that uh, that magic dust. Uh, Mark Hopkins is a futurist and blockchain evangelist. Uh, Mark authors a weekly newsletter focused on providing valuable cryptocurrency and blockchain insights uh, for tech adjacent professionals looking to be the resident Bitcoin person in their circles. You know what? I, I could... <laughs> I think I could benefit from this conversation. Uh, great parts. Uh, he's also known for being the creator of The Cube, uh, the number one media brand in tech event coverage. Uh, and actually, I've been on The Cube and have watched, I'm friends with the whole group there, and it's just been amazing to watch it grow. He was also the founding editor at Silicon Angle Media, which again is something that I've been part of for, for a long time. And he was also uh, one of the uh, the original uh, founding dudes at that startup scene uh, for, for many Many years now with all of that said since i'm also acting as producer i have to multitask and now i'm going to click the button that brings him into the show <laughs> hey mark welcome good to see you thank you for having me hey it's our it's our, our absolute pleasure so 
I, you know, I don't even know where to begin. You know, originally when we reached out to invite you to the show, there was so much going on with uh, the NFT craze sort of gaining steam again in, in sort of the, the mass uh, mass media. But also since then, we've watched Bitcoins just sort of uh, reset, I guess is maybe a mm -hmm. nice word for it. Uh, yeah. And so I think the, a good place to start is, Mark, tell us about you uh, and why you became so i mean just like you you are the go-to person for all things crypto uh and you're highly referenced by some of the smartest people in the world so let's start there what was your fascination what are you working on now and then we'll dive into the cues um so yeah i i've actually starting to get uh more of that question recently like you know why why are you into it um now that it's kind of uh it's kind of breaking through and getting some acceptance with mainstream institutions. Um, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, how I came upon it was actually kind of ironic for the era. It doesn't sound so out of place. Now, a buddy of mine who was a VP at bank of America of all places back in 2011, introduced me to Bitcoin, um, which was really, really uncommon now, but I think, Bit, you know, Bank of America probably has a team of Bitcoin people at this point, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, he and I were uh, old high school buddies that, you know, we would just, you know, hang out at the coffee shop till late at night talking about geeky things. And uh, he had just moved back to Dallas, which is where I'm at. And uh, we had uh, kind of rekindled that whole tradition. And one night he's like, hey, have you heard of this whole Bitcoin thing? I'm like, no, he's like, go ahead and install it on your laptop. Go install the wallet on your laptop. Tell you what you pay for you pay for dinner here and i'll just pay you with bitcoin and you can have some to play around with and figure out how this stuff works it's pretty skeptical like most people were at first like it just didn't seem like what is this virtual money it just it's very difficult to get your brain around until you actually start playing with it but uh you know it was a good time to really dive into it because all the community uh, with regard to uh, Bitcoin was very technical at that point. They were solving some of the very early problems of not just, uh, you know, the math and the, 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 the distribution phase, but like some of the interface problems. And really, uh, a lot of the, the messaging around crypto uh, had not really been ironed out. So it wasn't like I was having to be, you know, inculcated into kind of uh, the, the dogmatic tribe as it kind of is these days sometimes so uh, yeah what, what what i think attracted me to it though like the why uh is as I, as you know with my editorials over the years i do have a, a a political bent in a lot of the way i approach technology like I, I really do like to examine the policy implications of certain things you know back in you know one of the big stories we talk about was you know the the net, never neutrality stuff back in the day at silicon angle or the fdc stuff what it has to do with blogger uh you know uh, disclosure rules and that sort of thing uh and the political angles uh to you know self-sovereign currency is it, they're just endless you can get into it and talk about it for days uh, and so that's my personal hook um but there's 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 many other reasons to like it and be interested in it too I guess the one the one <clears throat> one question that I have before I get into the serious line of questioning is uh, so did you accept that dinner payment in Bitcoin and did you still hold it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes and no. Like I I mean I obviously have uh, quite a bit of Bitcoin having been in it since 2011. The uh, the problem uh, is that you know you don't value it back then as much. I had it on a tablet. I ended up putting it on a wallet on a tablet and I was flying around doing the cube stuff at one point and that tablet was just giving me trouble on the airplane. So I did a factory reset and there was like 16 Bitcoin on it that I just like, there's no way for me to get it back. It's It's been factory re reset away. Part of that coffee Bitcoin was in that group. So uh, it sound like a, that sounds like a, a life changing amount of money now. Back then, that was like you know, like three hundred bucks. I was like, oh, oh well. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, uh, I don't even know where to start. There's so many questions I have for you. Well, the the biggest thing is we just saw from David Gonzalez was uh, that you know that Bitcoin has a perception problem, but I think it also has like you you've written about so many times in the past a, a political problem like so many things i guess today in the united states but uh th the reality is this is that uh cryptocurrency is not going away uh it exists for a lot of very solid reasons uh and 
it it seems to be well regarded by the smartest people in the world yet when you look at the media these days all we seem to to focus on is the ups and downs uh and uh whatever the reddit memes are of, of that particular day so where do you think uh we should actually be from a perception standpoint and how should say the business audience that's watching this right now how should they start to think about bitcoin and cryptocurrency moving forward uh well it's it's always important to this is this is kind of the thrust of of the the sub stack that i've been working on and it's really kind of been the thrust of like a lot of my writing with regards to blockchain in the last you know five or six years but uh, it's kind of been like a concerted focus for the last six months or so on the sub stack since i started it and that is you, getting a grounding in the basic concepts is very important uh, that second to the, from the top headline you were just showing on uh, the, the one from two weeks ago, I think is also a very interesting for people that want to approach it from a high level view first to understand why should I care before they start understanding the fundamental stuff. It's that one that's titled uh, uh, is blockchain inherently political. Uh, and I think that's a particularly relevant way to get yourself hooked into this stuff, because as we have learned, I mean, like, I mean, you've heard the axioms over the years. Everybody has, uh, you know, tools are not, uh, they, they don't have a, a good or an evil side to them. It's just the wielder, right, imbues it with, you know, good or evil intent. And that's very easy to believe or defend when you're talking about a, a table saw or a hammer or something like that. But as we have discovered in the last couple of election cycles and the last, you know, I would say really three or four years, we've come to understand that things like social media or machine learning or surveillance technology, they have an inherent, you know, goodness or badness to it because of the way it's engineered. There's the, and there's the intent of the creators that, uh, you know, gets, gets well kind of woven into the technology itself. And to that end, you can look at, the origins of cryptocurrency, the origins of even blockchain, which is kind of a, a term that the enterprise popularized to kind of divorce it from the idea of cryptocurrency and, you know, the dark markets, dark web and all that stuff. But it's all the same technology and it all has, uh, there's an intent behind this protocol. And that intent is to uh, allow you to uh, have greater control over the things you put on that protocol. In this case, most of the time it has to do with value, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah, I was I, I the the idea of uh, the idea of, of of watching this grow and getting the politics out of it and just focusing on the areas where it has potential growth uh, or not potential growth, where it has the ability to drive new growth uh, and and new types of expertise required in order to drive that growth. I think it's a real opportunity here. Uh, so. I mean, the fact that you have this newsletter is incredible, <clears throat> but what is it that we seem to, as a mass, misunderstand about cryptocurrency? Um, well, I mean, most people just see it as fintech, and I think that's the biggest misconception. As you mentioned, most people only get interested in it whenever there is, uh, you know, a big price movement. And you know, I, I love the big price movements for personal reasons, obviously, uh, but I'll and 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 also because it brings new eyes. Uh, so the technology, but there's definitely an adoption curve of people that, uh, you know, you have to be in it for a while to kind of open your eyes to what these other applications are. Uh, I have this, I, occasionally I teach a class at SMU and UTD, and I always start that class by doing a one sentence definition of, of Bitcoin and blockchain. And then usually like the rest of the 90 minutes is just uncompacting that definition in different ways. But the, the, the sentence is that Bitcoin is the reference architecture for blockchain, which is a decentralized Internet protocol for mitigating or removing the requirement for trust between counterparties. Uh, a, a slightly less dense version of that is to say any time you have an interaction between two parties, individuals or organizations or whatever, and there's a middleman uh, of any type, you have a vector for exploitation of that relationship and a vector for, you know, the, the everything to get fouled up. And, and if that exists, that is a potential application for blockchain technology, a way to, to mitigate or remove 
the requirement for trust in an interaction. Seems to me, uh, John, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what do you think, but the first thing that popped into my mind is uh, voting uh, and the the uh, the ability to just embed trust into something that can be so easily politicized, it's, you know, the fabric of a democracy. Uh, and it would seem like any any true leader would want to accelerate not not just blockchain and cryptocurrency for you know, more more stable form of currency, but a more stable form of democracy just based on literally digital trust that brings about real trust. Now, uh, Mark, I have a counterpart here who is teeming, I'm sure, with amazing questions. But before I just pass it over to him, I'd also love to get your just high level overview uh, one of the articles I just showed on how all of this is relating to the latest trend, which is NFTs uh, and uh, you know helping not just the most basic of people understanding NFT, but you know the from from the the government, the business audiences, the innovation audiences that we have here on the show. You know, what do they need to think differently about? You know, aside from what what we see in in mainstream media, how NFTs apply to them. Uh, so NFTs are a, a really, I mean, I, I've spent probably the like uh, a little bit over half, maybe two thirds of the last four years specializing and, and working directly with NFT type technology. Uh, one of my friends is one of the co-authors of the original spec on the Ethereum network that creates the, the possibility for NFTs. Um, and so I, I've had a long time to think about it. Uh, and, and how to best explain it and, and all the different ways it could be used. I think the easiest way to get your arms around what NFT technology truly is, is it's just a technology for creating deeds or titles on a blockchain. So if you understand that thing I just said about what, why a blockchain should exist, you know, to mitigate the requirement for trust, you know, having deeds and titles exist in a trustless situation where you don't have to depend upon a bureaucracy or a government or a state particularly in parts of the world where maybe, you know, uh, the state is not as, as strong or as stable as it is here in the United States, you know, uh, having deal, deeds and titles exist on a blockchain actually make a lot of sense. Um, and mm -hmm. so from that, I, I'm actually quite surprised that uh, maybe I shouldn't have been in retrospect, quite surprised that art NFTs are the dominant application for, for what it is. Uh, in retrospect, it makes sense because uh, one of the applications you mentioned, voting, uh, is like many things that we try to do with blockchain. It relies heavily on the concept of identity being a solved solution for blockchain. And I, I, honestly, I think we're, we're, we're years away from that happening uh, for a variety of reasons. I don't think it's impossible. I just think there's a lot of work to do. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, and I, I'm, I'm going to ask your uh, your advice on the on on the back channel. Uh, I've been sitting on an NFT that I created uh, as a form of inspiring the acceleration of the adoption of blockchain. Uh, so it's sort of like a very meta uh, in of itself. But uh, with that, John, let me throw it over to you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so, Mark, uh, one thing that I've been trying to get my mind around is the distinction between uh, cryptocurrency as a new fundamental um, way of doing things versus uh, a series of tulip crazes that are stimulated by social media and by speculative fever. Um, and I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about what parts of the cryptocurrency revolution, if I can call it that, are here to stay versus what parts represent froth in terms of too many people sitting at home uh, with too much spare time and too much uh, extra money uh, and too much uh, time on uh, social channels and are simply, you know, kind of doing these mini uh, uh, tulip crazes uh, uh, to, uh, you know, try to get rich very quickly. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a question with a, a, probably a very, very long answer. Um, <laughs> and, and it is not an easy my, answer. My to forte. It. Yeah, <laughs> well, there's not a, my, my, my I think. My 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 preface to all this is there's not going to be an easy way. I can't give you just like a, a, an easy rubric to apply to anything new that may come along just because it's one of those things where you're if you're in the world of crypto for long enough, you can spot the behaviors uh, and it's not always obvious because some things that look revolutionary can be backed by scammers. Some things that look scammy can end up being an important technology. Uh, 
and it's not, you know, it's humans, you know, the brain is just a, a giant pattern recognition machine, right? And the better, the longer you're in a thing, the better you can get at spotting it. But in general, um, things I can, I can give you some things that I think that are here to stay. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're here to stay. I think a lot of the established uh, technologies that might be thought of as like, you know, top five or top 10 in market cap are likely here to stay or likely to be around for a long time. Um, I think much of that uh, has to do with uh, just the adoption curve, you know, like it's just a network effect. Right. Bitcoin is here to stay because it's the first and because it's got, you know, it's got the most intelligent and uh, uh, pervasive and I guess, persistent brains working on the problem. Right. And can, they're sticking to that project. They're not bunnying off to other projects. And same thing with Ethereum and same thing with several other projects that are kind of in that vein. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff in this last cycle of market hype, uh, things that our scams were actually much easier to spot as scams because they were just like, they were, they were uh, at least for someone that's been in, you know, for a year or two, because you, things like safe moon and, and like uh, these tokens that were like promising you returns, like anytime a financial investment promises you returns, uh, you know, go grab your wallet and put it in the safe or something like that's, that's not, that's not how any of this works at all. Um, I mean, my barometer of speculative fever is I was just walking up to the ferry building on Saturday to go to the farmer's market, and there were five posters advertising uh, crypto services and pointing out the, uh, you know, outsized returns of five non-random examples. And, you know, for somebody to run around with posters, stapling them to, uh, you know, post uh, to, uh, you know, billboards, uh, uh en route to the grocery store to me is a troubling sign. Yeah, <laughs> to um, add it to that, Mark, add it to that. It reminds me of like all of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the banners, both analog and digital that we used to see for ICOs. Uh, and then also, uh, the, the, all the, uh, the, the crypto conferences that were pervasive where, uh, Lamborghinis and Ferraris were always parked out front. In general, if you if a project is if, if the big if the project's big differentiator, you know, like because I'm I'm about I'm all about the idea of let it let a thousand cryptos bloom, let a thousand token <laughs> projects bloom. I want to see all the crazy combinations and permutations that you can do with this stuff, and let the cream rise to the top. But if you see a project and the biggest marketing point that it can it can bring to the table is you're going to make a lot of money with this. I mean, I'm not that interested in it. Maybe you will. I've I've passed on a lot of projects in terms of just you know because I, I approach some of this stuff like kind of being like an angel investor, right? I, I've got I'm, I'm not I'm not fabulously wealthy, but I've got a little bit to play around with. And sometimes if I see a project that I like that it's nascent, I'll be like, hmm, I'll put some money in that and see if it goes see if it goes anywhere. But uh, there, I've pat and I've passed on stuff that fits that kind of negative profile I just described. And if I hadn't passed on it, I would have, you know, I'd have another five, 10, 20 million or whatever to work with because it blew up, but I just don't, you know, and then it crashes. It's a right. pump and dump, right? It'll crash just as quickly. So this raises for me another question, a related question, which is um, a crypto literacy. I mean, you're in the business of educating people, obviously, and, you know, you have a newsletter and the newsletter is covering weekly slices of uh, of um, emerging um, events and themes. So, you know, what would you say to someone that um, it has yet to kind of figure out the a mental framework for looking at all of this and, you know, doesn't want to simply rely on mass media and, uh, you know, kind of all of the so-called experts out there who are purporting to explain stuff. How do you, how do you develop on an accelerated basis, uh, crypto literacy, so that you can begin to develop the um, the judgment that you've cultivated over the course of ten years. Uh, well, it, 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 it's a difficult question to answer in a kind of a one size fits all type response, uh, which is a, a big reason why I, I love getting into individual conversations with people and seeing what their situation is. Um, 
I can give you like a few different answers to that question and, and it'll probably fit the mo majority of the people listening. Um, if you are somebody who is looking to switch careers into blockchain or they just want to dive in, become a crypto person and that that's their life, uh, my strongest suggestion is to do kind of what I do, which is approach it like, like an angel investor would approach it. You need to understand the underlying technology. You need to understand what a good team looks like, what a bad team looks like, all these things. And you can approach investing in down market projects, uh, you know, just like your pick your favorite, you know, VC would. Right. You're, you're picking it based on the merits of the project. Uh, another approach, and this is only for a very small slice of people that are very good at calculus and no life is to approach it like a day trader, right? And, and there are certain ways to approach crypto trading from a quant jock perspective, just like, you know, a, a penny stock trader or a day trader or a HFT trader would do it. Um, and you can, you can learn those techniques and, and that those techniques mostly involve like the differences between the stock market and the crypto market. How do you price things? But it's, it's the same patterns in a chart that, that a normal day trader would learn. Um, the, the, the most common answer I give out though, is for normal normies, normal people that just want to live their life, but they want to have some exposure to crypto. And that is to learn about the concept of dollar cost averaging. It is the only way to get consistent returns across a broad spectrum of assets for an unsophisticated investor. And, and, and it's a very simple concept to grasp. And, you know, if you can use plenty of dollar cost averaging calculators on the internet. So you can kind of figure out how it would apply in a variety of situations. But the crux of it is pick a frequency that you're going to invest, pick an amount that you can afford to do and stick to that regimen. Don't, don't change it. And yep. as long as the market goes generally up and to the right, you're going to be fine. And most markets do, unless there's some extraordinary circumstances or you pick some really lopsided investments. Well, okay. But aside from, getting all the back issues of your newsletter. Um, you know, nobody's written the definitive book on crypto because it's moving too quickly oh, and publishing right. is, you know, kind of uh, a dinosaur medium, any, I mean, traditional publishing. So how, how I mean, aside from just ab absorbing a, 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 you know, a smattering of knowledge and trying to make sense of it uh, and reading your newsletter, obviously, uh, you know, how, how, what would you advise to this? Someone who wants to become a serious student of this stuff. Uh, I mean, you know, you know, read Wikipedia, you know, or look at, uh, you know, the websites <laughs> of these companies or, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a mess out there. Yeah. So, and, and, it, and it's the, the places where the community tends to live, it's not like you can just dive in and you're going to get a clean set of feeds to, to work with. But in general, most of, most of the cryptocurrency world, the Bitcoin world live on, they call it crypto Twitter. You know, it's just the. The, the, the group of influencers on Twitter. That's where a lot of the discourse happens. Uh, a ton of the discourse happens on Reddit in the r slash Bitcoin forums. Uh, and then there's an old website that's still very active that's been around. I mean, Satoshi used to use it called BitcoinTalk.org. Uh, and that's run by a, a, an anonymous Bitcoiner called Cobra. Um, and so, but it's that if you're wanting to dive into the deep end of discourse when it comes to this stuff, that's where you're going to find the community. Um, and, you know, fair warning, it's a rabbit hole. You jump in, you're probably not going to come out for a couple of years and you're going to end up looking like me with a neck beard. So. <laughs> um, so much more I could ask, but I think I'm going to turn it back over to Brian because we're at the top of the hour and, um, we have a few more miles to cover. So thank you. Uh, over, back to you, Brian. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, John. Mark, man, I do have more questions uh, for you. Uh, and, and almost like, you know, I feel like we've covered 101 and now we have to get, we have to graduate to the next series of uh, 102. Uh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> next series of questions uh, and also the, the direction. So if it's okay with you, Mark, we'd like to invite you back. Uh, and also, Definitely. Uh, I mean, the whole the whole concept of, uh, you know, tokenization of non obvious assets and the role of, uh, you know, crypto in um, the whole upskilling education, you know, credentialing revolution. And I mean, there's so many other things that 
I think we'd love to get your your input on. You know, how, how is this going to come alive in other big swaths of uh, yeah? Society? How can we can help accelerate that adoption, yeah. especially in in in, in, in mission critical applications that where you, you, where where it needs to happen? Uh, to oh, absolutely. A lot of absolutely. I mean, and and just I know you got to move on to your next guest, but the short answer to that is like folks like you. Uh, like that, that are more adjacent to the mainstream of, of business and academia are, are just got to get turned on to the concepts in the same way that like I've been deep diving on for the last 10 years. Like it's, it's, it's to the point where you don't have to defend your association to crypto being somebody in the mainstream. That was, that's the, been the hugest struggle for somebody like me for the last 10 years is, what's why are you why are you doing this why is this you know isn't this just for criminals I'm like no no it's not it's, it's a real business application now <laughs> well mark i think uh, john and i will uh, we'll take you out for drinks and you could pay us in bitcoin uh and <laughs> we'll look forward to that mark thank you so much we'll see you when we bring you back uh, on the show absolutely great to meet you mark ah wow holy moly uh i i i've got uh well, we could, it's, this will be a whole other conversation. We have we got to jump to our next guest. I'm so excited that he's here with us. Uh, and so, John, I'll I'll turn it over to you to uh, to introduce our next guest. Well, it's a real pleasure to introduce John Hagel. Uh, our paths have crossed uh, some over the years, and uh, it's been really a, a source of delight for me to see how his, um, I guess, I could say somewhat linear career, but a non traditional career has evolved as uh, the world has changed. Uh, John is a 40-year veteran of Silicon Valley. Uh, until recently, he was a partner at Deloitte, where he uh, was uh, involved in running something called the Center for the Edge with the eminent John Seeley Brown. Um, he's just uh, launched a new venture called uh, Beyond Our Edge LLC. So there's a thematic uh, uh, continuity uh, to this and has just written a book um, which takes up the, the notion of how we uh, can address fear, uh, which uh, uh, I think John will have a fair amount to say about um, in our conversation. Um, he's been around as a management consultant and author, a domain expert. He's on the board of the Santa Fe Institute, and has had a long relationship with the Davos folks. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, I think, this, I think that might have been the last time you and I ran into each other. Mm -hmm. So now we're, we're, we're meeting here. So. Uh, John Hagel, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here, for sure. <laughs> so um, maybe we could just jump right in and, and um, tell us about the new book and um, how that uh, uh, has, um, you know, kind of uh, been an evolution from the work that you've been doing uh, at the Center for the Edge and, and previously, because, um, yeah. you know, you're a big idea guy, and this is another set of big ideas. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I say that there are two catalysts for me to write the book. Um, one was that most of my career has been in business strategy. I was taught to believe that strategy is everything. You have the right strategy, you win. And uh, over the years, I've come to actually realize that psychology is much more important than strategy. If we don't understand the emotions that are shaping our choices and actions, the best strategy is just going to sit on a shelf somewhere. So I've been more and more focused on psychology and emotions. And then um, the other catalyst, and I started writing the book three years ago, so it was quite a while ago. Um, I was traveling around the world as part of my work, and I was struck by the extent to which everywhere I went, the dominant emotion that I was encountering was fear. At the highest levels of organizations, lowest levels, out in the communities, and while I think the fear is understandable, I think there are reasons for fear. I think it's also very limiting. And so the focus of the book is, first of all, acknowledging the fear, but then how do we make the journey beyond fear and cultivate emotions that will help us to have impact that's uh, more meaningful to us? And when you parse um, why people were uh, afraid, why they were experiencing fear, um, uh, what part of it was um, personal? What part of it was professional or career related? What part of it was, you know, more of a kind of um, uh, uh, reaction to all of the uncertainty and uh, uh, turbulence in the environment? I mean, was there any kind of discernible pattern in um, what you were hearing from 
the market or from the audience out there? Yeah, I think the again, it's hard to generalize. There are many different uh, forces that are shaping fear, but I focused on in my research on what I call the big shift, which is the long term forces that are reshaping the global economy and society. And three of three elements, consequences of the big shift. One is intensifying competition globally on all of us, both as companies and as individuals. Uh, more and more of us are worried that we're going to lose our jobs to uh, the robots and AI. Uh, so intensifying competition. Second is the notion of accelerating pace of change, things we thought we could rely on, no longer there. And then because of all the connectivity we've created on a global scale, small events in a faraway place in the world cascade into extreme events that are very disruptive. Dare I mention pandemic? I think any of those three could be very, it could ignite fear, but the combination of the three definitely creates fear. And then it, it occurs in different generations. So, you know, one thing I like to cite is uh, for older people, you know, the good news is we're going to live a lot longer than we expected. The bad news is we didn't save to live that long. So what are we going to do? There's fear there. And so again, I think fear differs depending on generations, but I think it cuts across the generations and it's around the world. It's not just in one place. Well, and, and fear, you know, when you see the bear in the woods, you uh, you feel fear and everything that you're describing, none of, none of uh, what you've just described is kind of delusional or imaginary. I mean, these are real, real yeah. issues. I say it's um, totally understandable. The fear is totally understandable. I, I think there are reasons for fear, but it's a very limiting emotion of, and we ought to recognize how limiting it is too. So, okay, so in the book, Journey Beyond Fear, then, it, it would seem as though you're presenting uh, ways of mitigating the negative effects of fear in an environment that reasonably induces fear so that you can get on with uh, the business of your life or your company or your, your mission. Am I, am I, is that a fair statement? Yeah, it's basically recognizing that, first of all, the limitations of fear, but then f making an effort to cultivate emotions that will help you to move beyond the fear. And, and by the way, I'm not saying that we're going to eliminate fear. The fear will still be there, though there are forces that are driving the fear. But I believe there are emotions like excitement that can really help us to move forward and have much more impact that's meaningful to us. You know, so I, I love what you said at the beginning about uh, the um, the ascendance of psychology in your thinking relative to traditional strategy, which I think we'd both agree is a somewhat uh, uh, rarefied intellectual, uh, it calls upon certain uh, psychological uh, attributes that um, yeah. uh, um, are, 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 a, are a slice of the psychological landscape. I remember when I was a, you know, a newly minted assistant professor at Harvard Business School, one of the senior guys said to me, oh, we're so glad you're here because now we have someone who can unpack the black box of personality, <laughs> right? Because, because you know, typically business school education stops at the skin, you know, and everything inside the skin is kind of uh, a mystery. You know, it's, uh, we assume, I guess, that everybody's going to have the same you know, behavioral repertoire and same um, uh, level of ambition and so on. So you have uh, some really intriguing um, uh, notions, which you've also described in your blog about uh, what uh, can be done, including, I believe, something that you call impact groups and relating that to social platforms that can support um, uh, a, a kind of a, um, uh, a social movement in, uh, of sorts, I would, I would, think. And I wonder if you can explain a little bit more what what you're hoping to see in terms of um, the groundswell of, uh, you know, empowered people who feel the fear and do it anyway, or who are linking together in these impact groups. I mean, what, what would you like to see as a result of this work you're doing on the topic of Journey Beyond Fear? Well, I'd like to see, have people see the opportunities that are out there. I mean, again, I think I talked about the big shift. The interesting paradox of the big shift for my work is on the one side, it creates mounting performance pressure, which I talked about that generates the fear. At the same time, those same forces 
are creating exponentially expanding opportunity. We can create far more value with far less resource, far more quickly than would have ever been imaginable. But if we're driven by fear, we can't even see those opportunities, much less be motivated to pursue them. We're just consumed by the near-term pressure that's, that we're all feeling. So I, my hope is that if we start to recognize how limiting fear is, we will be able to uh, cultivate those emotions. And in that context, to your, to your comment about impact groups, I've come to believe, again, based on research that I've done, that the people who are most effective at overcoming fear and cultivating these other emotions typically do this as part of a small group. It's anywhere between three to 15 people. No, no more than 15 because it involves developing deep trust-based relationships with each other, where on the one side, you're supporting each other as you run into the inevitable obstacles and failures. You're, we're here to back you and support you. Let's keep going. But on the other side, challenging each other, constantly challenging each other to say, how can we have even more impact addressing the opportunities that are out there? And so it's that combination that I think is very powerful and helps to really uh, motivate people to take action in a much more uh, bold way. And how, how do you how are these impact groups going to work? I mean, are they leaderless groups? Is there a playbook? Is there an agenda? Do they come together? Do they come to your uh, to the your <laughs> website or to a platform that you know will kind of compose the teams and? Uh, yeah. Are they meant to last for a long time? I mean, what, what are some of the specifics? Yeah, well, I, I, I'll just give an example. I, 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 there's no manual that says here's step one, step two, step three. Uh, people are doing this already in, intuitively. Uh, one area that I've done research in is extreme sports, things like big wave surfing. You know, you talk to big wave surfers and you think, oh my God, that's a solo sport. There's only one person out on that surfboard. It's a solo sport. No, the big wave surfers, the extreme surfers, come together in small groups on the surf break where they develop deep trust-based relationships with each other and they're supporting and challenging each other to go ride a bigger and bigger wave. And so I think that there are many practices within these work group, within these impact groups, and I've written about that too, um, that can be helpful in terms of really bringing these groups together and helping them to achieve what they want to achieve. But it's, um, it's ultimately about personal relationships and developing that trust with each other. It says, we're here to do this together. Well, and I guess there are plenty of examples of those um, uh, groups with those kinds of impacts. I mean, the whole mastermind movement and, you know, entrepreneurs getting together uh, virtually these days, um, not to mention therapy groups of many kinds uh, provide that kind of um, support. And I, I guess the lingering question would be, you know, what's the framework within which those groups could form uh, under the journey beyond fear uh, rubric? Um, uh, yeah, I think that, um, the, uh, one of the, I, I have three pillars that I talk about in the journey beyond fear. <clears throat> the first is a narrative. The second is passion. And the third is learning platforms. And the challenge for me is that everyone uses those words in very different ways. I have very specific definitions. But to your question about impact groups, I think one of the key elements for an impact group is developing a, a shared uh, narrative about what is the big opportunity out in the future, uh, coming together and agreeing on what is that opportunity and why is it so meaningful to us? And what are the actions that we need to take? These impact groups have a bias to action. They're not just conversation groups where you sit around and talk about something that's really fun and interesting. No, they're driven to act and have more and more impact over time. That's what excites them. And it's because it's helping them get to that opportunity that's truly exciting out in the future. And the narrative frames that. It's a call to action to say, you know, the opportunity isn't going to just materialize by itself. We have to act and learn in the process. Yeah, I mean, it, it almost sounds like, uh, you know, you're... Uh, you know, your, 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 your modal uh, 
startup group, right? I mean, you're you're confronting uncertainty. You're probably very anxious. You've just more gotten a third mortgage on your house, and you got to band together and go out and make it happen. Or people in uh, the in the foxhole uh in uh in combat so one one last question which is um and then i'll turn it over uh to my uh, uh partner uh, brian which is um how about when we ideally we'd want this kind of learning or cap capacity building to start you know i'm i'm recently reviewing the literature on the positive education movement and there's you know so you look at growth mindset and you look at grit and uh, you look at um, Martin Seligman's work uh, on, uh, you know, positive uh, uh, attitude and so forth and so on. And uh, those seem to be all antidotes to fear in some respects uh, or, or, you know, kind of leaning forward as opposed to leaning back. What are your thoughts about those kinds of frameworks? And also, what, what are your thoughts about journeying beyond fear, you know, when you're in the K-12 age group? Yeah, well, again, one of the pillars in my book is this notion of passion. And it's, again, everybody has a different definition of passion. I, I have a specific form of passion, again, based on research that I've done, that I believe is going to be particularly powerful in helping us to move beyond fear. But the pushback I get from a lot of people is, oh, come on, John, some of us are capable of that passion. But most of us just want to be told what to do and get the security of an income. And, you know, my response to that is let's go to a playground and let's look at children six or seven years old. Show me one that doesn't have that excitement about the unknown and venturing forth and taking risk and curiosity. We all had it. What happened? We went to school and we were taught to listen to the teacher, memorize what the teacher says and then play it back to show that we've memorized it. And we, if you have a passion, leave it on the playground or you know, do it at home, but don't bring it into the classroom. And I think we, most people took that lesson. One of the things I did in my research was I looked at in the US workforce, all the US workforce, how many people have this kind of passion about the work they're doing. At most, based on the survey that I did, 14% have this kind of passion about their work. 86% have just been crushed on it. So I think the key is recognizing that we all have the capacity for that passion, but we need to draw it out, make an effort to find it and draw it out because it's not gonna come out just by itself, especially in an environment that crushes passion. Right. Understood. Well, thank you, John. I'm going to uh, throw it back over to Brian now, who's looking very pensive. So uh, <laughs> I think he's got a good uh, question bubbling up there. I just made me think about uh, it just made me think about uh, research that showed that, you know, that low morale in, in workplaces is a global pandemic as well. Like 80 percent of employees report uh, low morale or full full on become detractors. Uh, and that's that's a problem. Uh, and I thought uh, as you were talking, John, about uh, uh Sir Ken Robinson's work on education and creativity and how yeah. just schools in general had take a lot out of us. And the playground analogy is, is, is spot on. First, I, I, before I go to the question, I, I have to say, John, it's just, a, it's just wonderful to see you uh, yeah. again. Uh, in, in addition to Davos, uh, Mr. Hegel has also spoken at Pivot, which was the conference I used to, uh, yeah. I used to organize. And uh, <clears throat> I do miss that. But John, you've been a, a guiding light for 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 many for many years and for many of us. Uh, so it's just it's just an absolute pleasure. And this book is is just right right on and at the right time, I believe. Uh, so with those three pillars, before we even get there, I'd love to hear something that I'd love to hear your advice on something that I've seen. Uh, in organizational transformation for many years and just in general you know in the startup world those who do and those who don't but those who have great ideas and just talk themselves out of it uh, sometimes fear is is misdiagnosed as this denial uh, or uh, or or we as individuals we might just say we might use denial as a defense mechanism instead of addressing that we are actually fearful or other biases you know might kick kick in to prevent us from actually seeing that we're in our own way. How do you, how do you break through that sort of initial step? 
No, it's very challenging. Again, one of the pushbacks I get from people who are read the book or heard about the book is, you know, they aren't hearing a lot of people say that they're they're afraid. You know, why am I saying this is a dominant emotion? And my response is, we live in cultures around the world where expressing fear is a sign of weakness. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to express fear. That means you're a weakling. So we find other emotions to express it. And one, one that I think is particularly prominent around the world today is anger. But if you go underneath that anger, <laughs> I find fear. It's being driven by fear, but anger is a strong, good emotion to express. So let's do that. And I think part of it, it, it to your question about how do we get people to, to see that, I mean, and, and it, it was part of my book, is part of my book is a personal memoir. I talk about my own journey beyond fear. I grew up in a childhood where I had huge fear. I was totally dominated by fear. And it took me many decades, actually. It wasn't until my 50s when I ultimately made the breakthrough of the journey beyond fear. And I learned a lot of lessons along the way. And I think part of that, again, is being willing to express to others the fear that you have so that they feel it's okay for them to share their fear because if, if everybody's sitting around the table saying, I'm not afraid, you know, I'm just really upset or I'm in denial or whatever, good luck. Um, we, that, I think the first step in the journey is acknowledging and recognizing our own fear. Oh, I mean, I, Mr. Cow, you know, we need, uh, we need a real time, like sound bite cap. You have someone to capture like these great <laughs> the truth bombs. That was, I, I I didn't want to open this door, but you 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 did bring it up in a, in a, in a super relevant way, and I think that this is really important now more than ever. Fear is often thought of as a sign of weakness, and so when you express it in anger, it come it 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 sort of fools us into believing that that's an expression of strength. Uh, when in fact it's the opposite, <laughs> that the anger is an expression actually of, of, of weakness and more actually. And how, how do we accept that? What's your advice on accepting that? That yeah, if, if we could solve for that, I, I think I could start talking to my neighbors again. I, it, it's just so crazy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how much anger is out there? It reminds me, sorry, on just a side note, if you watch Ghostbusters, you remember that the anger in New York City is what fueled the rise of all of the ghosts. Uh, <laughs> and that, uh, I'm, I'm a geek, sorry, I just have to just share that. But it feels like we're at that moment right now. And this is something so personal that to drive our own development. I don't think that any of this is sustainable. So how do we come to grips with that? You know, shifting from that, what we view as a point of strength, that is actually a point of weakness. Yeah. No, I, it's challenging. I don't want to in any way say that it's an easy journey or easy path to follow. I, I just, again, part of my motivation for writing the book was to really draw out the limitations of these emotions and why, you know, why do we want to be so limited? And, and again, it's a vicious cycle. I mean, it's not just that it limits us, but the more we, we feel it, the more, the less we're going to accomplish over time and the more we're going to fail actually. Um, so I think it's again, partly just recognize being willing to engage in conversations to probe around the fear that that's being expressed and really, asking questions to say, you know, what, what's, what's underneath that anger? Why is there so much anger? What, what are the things that really are upsetting you? And getting into the, the foundations of the emotions. And it, again, it's hard to do. Partly, again, it's, it's starting with yourself and being willing to share about yourself so that, you know, people can see that it's okay to, to share and actually helpful to share. Um, but no, it's, it's not easy for sure. You could almost make the argument that the, uh, explosion of, uh, delusional thinking in our society, uh, especially over the last 24 months or so is related to the repression of fear because it's coming from people who are, have a lot to be afraid of and, uh, you know, who've resorted to a counterfactual narrative, uh, to kind of make everything okay. 
uh, which is very common for people who have psychotic disorders. And this is kind of like, you know, in a way a mass psychosis. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and, and it's, and it's spreading, uh, and it, it, it's not being treated. In fact, it's being, uh, emboldened, uh, with, with a lot of the technologies that we're surrounded with. And so it makes me think about the importance, John, of your, of, of your notion of impact groups in that uh, it's, not, it's not about aligning with a side. Uh, it's about being you and your aspirational self uh, and then surrounding yourself with the people and things that'll help you move on a path of which then you will be surrounded by the inevitable groups and communities of those who align with your direction. Uh, that's just a powerful notion. I'm just so happy that you wrote this book, John. I think the last question I have for you uh, is, is this, is that um, the admission of fear or even just the, the work toward fear, especially in a work environment uh, where it's, where it's not just seen as a sign of weakness. It's also uh seen as sort of like a, a lack, I don't, how do I put this, a lack of motivation or ambition? Uh, how, can, how can managers, how can leaders sort of foster that, uh, that best of a future self out of their employees uh, and help them see that maybe they're angry, maybe they're fearful, or maybe they're just hiding whatever, it, however they define it, uh, to bring out the best of them, to help them take steps forward in a direction that they might not have otherwise? Yeah. No, it's interesting. I, I think leaders play a, are going to play a critical role in terms of this journey beyond fear. And um, the challenge is we've cultivated a model of leadership. I'm going to generalize, but I think it's true of most large organizations around the world. The mark of a strong leader is the one who has an answer to every question. No matter what the question, you can count on the leader to have an answer. And by the way, if they don't, Maybe it's time to get a new leader, somebody who does. And the leaders claim to have all the answers. And by the way, I believe that's one of the reasons, you know, we all know the surveys of the erosion of trust in all of our institutions. I think one of the key reasons for the erosion of trust is we have leaders who say they have the answers to all the questions. And we know either they're clueless, they don't understand how the world is changing, or they're lying. And in either case, we don't trust them. So I think the mark of a, of a leader in the future in this journey beyond fear is the leader will be the one who has the most powerful questions and who will freely acknowledge they don't have an answer and ask for help. They will be willing to ask for help. And that sends a message to the organization. Number one, questions are okay, not just okay, they're necessary, again, we live in an organizational culture where questions are a sign of weakness. What do you mean? You don't know the answer? Go read the manual again. So questions are necessary and important and asking for help <laughs> is necessary and important. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of dedication to getting to more and more impact. And I think that's the, um, that's the powerful leader of the future that will help us in that journey beyond fear. But, not very many of them out there today, for sure. Oh man, how inspiring is this? Could be a whole new, a whole new uh, chapter for the show. Uh, that I think you, what what you also just said there uh, is that what we've done with management is replicated what we did in our education system. It's been incredibly hierarchical uh, in a command and control sort of way, and it reminds me of that quote from Sir Ken Robinson, which was the role of a creative leader is not to have all the ideas, but it's to create a culture where everyone can have ideas and feel that they're valued. And so I think your book actually also serves beyond uh, individual and professional development is to one is so sort of a, a future organizational aspiration, a new model uh, for bringing out the best of uh, of everyone, of humanity itself. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Hagel, uh, how wonderful. I hope to see you uh, at one of our, our uh, infamous dinners soon. Uh, and such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank Great you. you Great questions. Take care. Bye. Woo! My heart's racing a little bit. That's uh, incredible. Yeah. And it uh, looks like... Uh, uh, 
Mark is still uh, backstage and commenting on all of these uh, all of these th wonderful things. It's fantastic. Uh, really interesting to juxtapose the two um, guests and what they have to say because you know crypto takes us into the unknown and there is uh, you know kind of greed and fear uh, are the dynamics of uh, investing, especially in high beta situations like crypto. And then we had. John talk about uh, journey beyond fear. So they were in a funny kind of way. Uh, we couldn't have planned it better. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm just loving this quote from Patrick. Uh, uh, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. It's fantastic. Uh, always, always a student. Uh, that's my that's my philosophy. Well, John, as always, such a pleasure. I'm going to um, allow allow here. I gotta just click some buttons to get us. <laughs> in order to close the show. Where's that exit music? Gregarious, I miss you. We do have to revisit, though, that uh, that soundbite idea because I, I was able to capture one for Mr. Hagel, but uh, there was just too many there, uh, and you can almost use those to summarize the show. It was just fantastic. And also with Mark and his, almost like gave us a a, a formula, like a, a playbook for how do you start to embrace uh, crypto and how do you build a framework around its approach? So I think there's something to reverse engineer there as well. So uh, maybe we get that definitive bookmark uh, <laughs> written just by, by your uh, your advice there. So Mr. Ko, uh, thank you so much. A pleasure as always to see you. See you next week. I'll see you next week. And okay. everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. You make this show, your questions, your comments, your observations are what inspires us every single week. We'll see you next Thursday at 10.30 a.m. Pacific.